Mr. McCoy back with part seven of The Devil's Arithmetic. As you recall, the villagers gathered uneasily within the half circle of soldiers and waited to be led into the show. Shmuel spoke gently. They insist that we go with them in those trucks. No, Hannah protested in a whisper. Their argument is persuasive, Shmuel answered as though her forefinger pointed at her like a gun. They say all Jews are to be resettled. It is government policy. I heard that too, Yitchik added. Government policy. They have been settling villagers closer to the big cities. I thought out here they would leave us alone. Another man argued, what does a goyish government have to do with us? A kick in the face and a hand in the pocket, said another. Wait, wait, Schmuel said. His voice was soft, but his face was grim. Remember those guns? Beggy moved silently into the protection of his arms. What about our wedding? She meant it for his ears alone, but Hannah was close enough to hear him every plaintive syllable. We will be married, Beggy. Your father will marry us. Maybe not here in your show. Maybe not even under a wedding canopy. Not under a canopy? Baby was shocked. We will be married in God's sight, Shmuel said adamantly. I promise you that nothing will keep us apart. The Nazis will, Hannah said suddenly. She could feel the rapid thudding of her heart as she spoke. They'll take you from here and put you in a concentration camp. Then they'll put you in gas ovens and kill you. She could hear her voice rise in pitch. Its intensity frightened her. Chaya, Gittle said sharply, putting her fingers up to Hannah's lips and whispering hoarsely at her. Hush, the soldiers will hear you. Turning in Schmuel's arms, Feggy stared at Hannah, her beautiful face sharp, her eyes nearly all pupil. How can you talk like that? Your words will fly up to heaven and call down the angel of death. Lilith's bridegroom with his poison sword. Nonsense. You talk like one of the old women in the village. Angels and poison swords. Why not flying chariots in the finger of the Lord? Chaya does no such thing. How could she? She is only a child, as you are no longer. She is a child with too much imagination and stories filling her head. She has just been recalled by a miracle from the doors of death. Shame, shame, Feggy, to make her into some kind of monster. Rachel interrupted. Tante Giddle, I think I know what Chaya is talking about. She told us a story this morning about two children named... She thought a moment. Yes, Hansel and Giddle. Gretel, Hannah corrected automatically. Yes, Gretel, Rachel said. And there is a witch who shoves little boys into ovens and eats them. She shuddered drew a deep breath. A fairy tale. The gas ovens, I mean, are no fairy tale, Hannah said. Gittle raised her chin, squinted her eyes, and ignoring Hannah, addressed Feggy directly. See, my almost sister-in-law, the child was just reciting a story, and surely we have more important things to worry about than fairy tales. Her hands went up and then back down to her skirt, where she wiped them twice. And what could be more important than such a curse? Feggy asked, adding slowly, my sister Gittle. Gittle smiled. Are your mother and grandmother not important? Where are they? Why have they not come out to greet us? Feggy looked around. Gittle, you are right. Where are they? And where is Tante Sarah and Tante Deborah and... Her voice trailed off and she turned back to look at Shmuel. And all the rest? Where are they? Her hand twisted and twisted one gold ear knob nervously. So where are they? Share what you think with your fellow listener. Stony-faced Shmuel wouldn't look down to meet her eyes. In a flat voice, he said, The colonel informed us that they have already been sent for resettlement. We will meet them there. You can't believe that, Hannah cried. What else can we believe? Shmuel asked. Gas ovens? Lilith's bridegroom? Poison swords? The angel of death? What else can we believe? Just then, Reb Borish cleared his throat loudly, <clears throat> and all the little knots of people who had been talking fell silent. My friends, my neighbors, my children, he began, it seems we have no choice in this matter. 
The government has declared that we are to be relocated for the duration of this war, this war in which we Jews take no part, so it is with governments. There was a murmur of assent from the men. My wife, my mother, my sisters, and all of yours, those who were waiting here in Vias for our return from the forest, those who were getting ready for the wedding, they have been sent ahead. They have been taken with them, and they have taken with them what clothing and household goods we shall need in the resettlement camp. But what of our clothes and our goods, called out Yitchik, those of us who are not from Vias? We will share what we have, said the rabbi, for, uh, for are we not all neighbors and friends? Are we all not brothers and sisters in God's eye? Are we not? All will be taken care of said the Nazi colonel, interrupting smoothly. You will want for nothing. We wanted for nothing except to be left alone here in Biosk, said a voice. Nevertheless, the colonel continued smiling, in this matter, we will make the ruling. When we get to your new homes, anyone who wants to work will be treated humanely. Anyone who wants to work, that is. The tailor will sew, the shoemaker will have his last, and you will be happy among your own people, just as we will be happy you have followed the government's orders. The snake smiles, but it shows no teeth, murmured the bachelor. Hannah wondered if anyone else heard him. Raising his hands, the rabbi began to speak. The colonel has assured me that some of his soldiers will remain billeted here to guard our stores and houses and schools from harm while we are gone. At my request, the soldiers will pay attention to the show to make sure the peasants do not desecrate it. Better the fox to guard the hens and the wolves to guard the sheep, the badger said. This time he was heard, and there were murmurs in the crowd. One man called out, but Red Borch, why would they billet soldiers here if they are needed elsewhere for the war? Am I a general to answer such questions? The rabbi asked. Am I the head of state? I only know what they have promised me this, so this I believe. They say the war is almost over, and we will not be gone from Fiosk for long. How long is eternity, the bachelor muttered. Hannah tried to speak again, but this time Giddle's hand covered her entire mouth. Be still, child, Giddle whispered. Whatever your objections, be still. This is not one of your stories that ends happy ever after. There are not imaginary bullets in those guns. Listen to the rabbi. He is right to calm us. We go gently. No harm will come. Suddenly, remembering the pictures on television, the ones that made her grandfather so crazy, Hannah shook her head. But she shook it silently as Gittle commanded. She wanted to cry. She knew she'd feel better if she could. But no tears came. Drawing a deep breath, she heard the rabbi began to pray aloud. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is come. The others joined in, even Hannah. So do you think the rabbi and the others are right to trust the Germans? You know the answer. Share your thinking with your fellow listener. They climbed into the trucks and family groups, reluctant to be parted. Since Shmuel would not let go of Feggy's hand despite the rabbi's fierce stare, the rabbi was forced to climb into the truck with them, standing next to Hannah. Yitchik handed his children up to Gittel one at a time, and she kept her arms tight around the little girl, Tipsora. Uh, there were finally so many villagers packed into each truck, there was no room to sit down. So they stood, the children up on the men's shoulders. They looked like holidayers off on a trip, but they felt to Hannah all crushed together like cattle going to be slaughtered for the market. The trucks barreled down the road, winding road, their passengers silenced by the dust, deviling up and by the heat. After a bit, to keep the children in her truck from crying, Dylan began to sing. First she tried a lullaby called Yankili to quiet them, then several children's songs, but the truck continued without a stop, carrying them farther and farther from Vias, on the roads most of them had never seen. She broke into a song that, for all its wailing minor notes in the la 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 chorus, sounded angry. Hannah tried to make out the words above the noise of the truck. They were about someone called a chaper, a snatcher, or kidnapper who dragged men off into the army. One verse went, Sir, give me a piece of bread. 
Look at me so pale and dead. Hardly seen the song to come choke. But first, Shmuel, then Yitchik, then several of the other men in their truck joined in, singing at the top of their voices. The children on their perches clapped in rhythm. At last, even Feggy and her father began to sing. Hannah listened to the growing chorus in wonder as the song leaped from truck to truck down the long road. Didn't they know? Didn't they guess? Didn't they care? She kept remembering more and more bits and pieces of her classroom discussions about the Holocaust, about the death camps and the crematoria, about the brutal Nazis and the six million dead Jews. Was knowing or not knowing more frightening? She couldn't decide. A strange, awful taste rose in her mouth, more bitter even than the Sadar's bitter herbs. And they were for remembering. She fought the taste down. She would not, she could not be sick. Not here, not now. She opened her mouth to catch a breath of air and found herself singing. The sound of her own voice drowned out the steady drone of the tires on the endless, twisting road. If you were Hannah, what would you do to convince the others that they really are in danger? Share with your fellow listener. And now more of The Devil's Arithmetic. Look, Schmuel cried over the noise of the singing. At his voice, everyone suddenly quieted following his pointing hand. Ahead of them was a train station, its windows sparkling in the bright spring sun. There were armed guards standing in front of the station house door and scattered around the periphery. Two wooden boxcars squatted on a nearby site. The trucks pulled up to the station house. Jumping out of the cabs, the soldiers called up to the villagers, Get out! Out! Quickly! When no one moved, the soldiers raised their guns. Shmuel put his hands on the raised panel and leaped down. Yitchik handed his son down to Shmuel, then jumped down himself. The other men climbed out, turned, lifted their arms to the children. Then the women and children, clumsier in their party skirts, climbed down with the help from the men. Faggy's wedding dress caught on a protruding nail. When she had to rip it loose, she began to cry and could not be comforted. Quickly, quickly, the soldiers called, gesturing with their guns. Rounding up the villagers, they herded them toward the trains. There were piles of things spread out along the tracks, as if they had been dropped by a fleeing army. Anna saw suitcases and carpet bags, some carefully packed, and some with their contents spilling out. Dresses and shawls were scattered around, and there was a bag of what looked like medicine, several dozen jewelry cases, a sack full of milk powder, even a small chest of baby toys. That is Grandma's satchel, Feggy shrieked, pointing to a tapestry bag with wooden handles. Papa, Papa, they have left Grandma's things here. What will she use in the resettlement camp? Before the rabbi could answer, Hannah had turned to Giddle. I know. Do not say a word, child, Giddle pleaded. Not a word. More and more, the villagers began to recognize baskets and bags belonging to their families, but they were not allowed to stop by the pile, simply pushed closer to the boxcars. When the last of them was out of the trucks, the soldiers made a great circle around them. A high-ranking officer, but not the colonel who had spoken to them before, stepped into the circle with them. They looked to him, and he raised his hand for silence. Now, Jews, listen. Do what you are told, and no one will be hurt. All I ask is your cooperation. His voice was ragged, as if it had been used too much recently. He had a dark blonde mustache, bad teeth. Hannah felt Giddle's arm tighten on her shoulder, and the villagers began to murmur among themselves. Hannah held her breath. If she held it for long enough, she thought she might wake up from this awful nightmare and be back safe at her family Sadar. But when she had to let her breath out at last, she began to cough desperately, and Giddle pounded on her on the back. Lie down, was all she heard. What? Here? On the ground? Someone cried out. Of course, Jew, came the officer's voice. And then, my men will move among you and take your papers and jewelry for safekeeping. You mean for your own keeping, a man called out. Hannah thought it might have been Shmuel. Who said that? the officer asked. 
When no one answered, he narrowed his eyes. The next one who speaks, I will shoot. Tense moments are coming as the devil's arithmetic continues. Thank you.